Welcome, professors, guests from universities, college, classmates, friends, and seminarians. Let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord, Lord is, is with thee. thee. Blessed, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for, for us sinners, sinners now, now and at the hour of our death, death. amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Virgin Immaculata. Amen. Well, first, I'd like to thank you all for the questions that you sent in and those who have braved the elements tonight to be with us. Bishop Robert Barron is the Bishop of the Diocese of Winona, Rochester in Minnesota and the founder of Word on Fire Catholic Ministries. He is the host of Catholicism, a groundbreaking, award-winning documentary about the Catholic faith, which aired on PBS. Bishop Barron's most recent film series, Catholicism, The Pivotal Players, won an Emmy Award and has been syndicated for national television. Bishop Barron is a number one Amazon best-selling author and has published numerous books, essays, and articles on theology and the spiritual life. Many of those adorn our bookshelves here at the college. His most recent book, This Is My Body, has sold over one million copies. He was a religion correspondent for NBC and has also appeared on Fox News, CNN, and EWTN. Bishop Barron's website, wordonfire.org, reaches millions of people each year, and he is one of the world's most followed Catholics on social media. His YouTube videos have been viewed over 146 million times, and he has over 3 million followers on Facebook. He's engaged in dialogue with Jordan Peterson, Lex Friedman, Dave Rubin, Ben Shapiro, and William Lane Craig, among other influential thought leaders. And he's been invited to speak about religion at the headquarters of Facebook, Google, and Amazon. He has keynoted many conferences and events all over the world, including the 2023 World Youth Day in Lisbon, the 2016 World Youth Day in Krakow, and the 2015 World Meeting of Families in Philadelphia, which marked Pope Francis' historic visit to the United States. So on behalf of the Pontifical North American College, Bishop Robert Barron, welcome. Thank you. So we agreed to have these questions submitted beforehand, but I wanted to start off with a bit more of a softball one to get us warmed up. Today was your first free day from these grueling weeks at the Synod. What did you do today? <laughs> it's true, the Synod's been a workout. And, and I was at a Synod five years ago on young people, so I kind of knew the routine. But this has been tougher in many ways, uh, and the sheer length of it. We work Monday through Saturday. You know, and it's um, all day. And then the homework. This one has homework. Uh, <laughs> no kidding, last time we just, in small groups, you just, you know, whatever's on your mind. We have to come into each group session with a prepared text. And then if you're the um, secretary or the rapporteur of the group, you have to put together a kind of a lengthy, and then if you want to make a, um, your own intervention, you have to write that out. So it's, <laughs> it's a lot of work. What I did today actually was a little bit of a retreat because I, was, I had a meeting this afternoon at one of the dicasteries about a, a certain development at Word on Fire and I was praying about that. And um, I went to a series of churches. So I love uh, San Agostino, you know, where Monica's buried, I, I prayed there. Then I went over to um, San Luigi de Francesi with the Caravaggios. Then I went to um, the Jesu. I tried to get into Sopra Minerva, but it was closed. So the Dominicans didn't have it together today. Uh, but I went to the Jesu and prayed there and uh, just sort of made my way around in a prayerful spirit getting ready for this meeting at the dicastery. So it was, uh, it was a great day. It was a great day. Wonderful. Well-deserved break. Now you have become a household name. And I was thinking earlier, an experience that you have probably never had is if, if people asking you if you're related to me. <laughs> All the time. All the time. <laughs> so, how has it been being able to get from one end of a street to another in Rome? Do people recognize you coming down the avenue? Yeah, when I wear the clerical clothes. Like today when I was wandering around, I just had street clothes on. But when I had the clerical clothes on, and you're in a Catholic environment, yeah, I, I'll, I'll get that. Yeah. Which is lovely. You know, I mean, we're on fire, thank God, has gone out all over the place because of the internet and the English language, you know, gives you tremendous uh, range. So it's a joy, you know, it happened in, when I was in Lisbon and uh, now here, so love that. Oh, that's wonderful. Love that. Well, we are very grateful for your presence tonight, your willingness to- I, I love the neck, you know, I was here, I first came in 2005 or something, into this room, I gave the Carl Peter lecture. Right. 
You still have that every year? We do. I was invited by the great Jim Quigley to do that. Then he said, you know, you can come back as a scholar in residence. At the, we have that category at the NAC. And I said, oh, that sounds interesting. So I came in 2007, did a little bit of teaching at the Angelicum and, and here. And then 2010, I came back under that same rubric uh, to finish my Catholicism book. You know, the book that was based on the film series I did. So I lived in a wall apartment and I wrote that book entirely here. Um, and I, I was here five years ago for the Synod for a month, so I, I always love coming back here to the NAC. Well, if you want to get away for another scholar in residence semester, I think you're more than welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Ryan would appreciate your presence. Good, good. All right, so I want to start in these questions. Yeah. In your 2016 book, Seeds of the Word, you examine some of the altars to the unknown God found in American culture, which can act as bridges for the new evangelization. It seems that America, especially following the pandemic, is losing a sense of a shared culture and identity through increasing polarization and social isolation. Our religious imagination has been heavily influenced by a Christendom that was distinctly European. Is there a properly American culture? And if so, are there elements that would lend themselves to supporting the new evangelization? Yeah, it's a big question there. Uh, I, I don't know if I would... <laughs> focus so much on America is the West. I, th I think the West, there's a certain commonality. And, and here's something, maybe I'll give a surprising answer. Um, I've been a great critic of wokeism, which I think is a terrible thing. And I don't take back one little thing I've, I've said critically about it. But, you know, as Augustine taught us a long time ago, evil is always a corruption of the good. So there's, there's always something good you can find in something that's, that's off kilter. And I think wokeism is a good example. Um, you know, it obsesses a lot of people in, our, in, in the West, especially young people. Um, but how peculiar when you think about it. I mean, why should we be so concerned about the poor and the marginalized and the, and the little guy who's been, you know, knocked around? And I mean, why should we have this passion for justice, especially on, on behalf of those who are uh, abused? Um, and here I'm relying on, on the work of Tom Holland, um, not the kid that plays Spider-Man, but the, um, the British historian, Tom Holland, you know, to notice how remarkably Christian our convictions are in a way that we don't even notice. We just think, oh, of course, of course we should be concerned about the, the oppressed and the marginalized. Well, there's no of course about it. That comes indeed from Christianity. It comes from the cross of Jesus and God's identification with someone who'd been pushed to the margins and who had been, you know, uh, treated with great injustice. And so I, I would take that as an as a evangelical starting point, that there's something at the heart of the sort of wokest mentality that is deeply Christian, and that we should just be straightforward about that and say, look, let's, let's follow that lead. The other one that I find often with young people, because that, that's one is the social justice concerns are so important for young people. And you say, well, where do those come from, those objective moral convictions? Because I, I presume you don't think, you know, your opposition to human trafficking is some little private opinion of yours. You don't think it's just an accidental cultural consensus. You think there's something really objectively wrong about that. Well, why? <laughs> why would you hold that? Where do those come from, objective moral values? In a similar way, I think in the West, there's a huge valorization of the sciences, right? The physical sciences. Look how during COVID that was used and abused, right? But this, this science, I believe in science, that's what's really important. Well, okay, <laughs> to believe in science is to believe in objective intelligibility. You have to hold that something like intelligibility obtains at all levels of reality. Where does that come from? <laughs> Why in the world should there be such a remarkable and universal intelligibility. So I take those two things which are often seen as enemies of religion, right? Oh, science, that opposes religion. And, you know, our, our kind of woke convictions, that stands against the traditional morality. No, on the contrary, I would say, those two things at their heart are, are deeply religious. So I think those are two bridges that we can find within the Western, even very skeptical Western culture today. Do you find engaging some of these figures that don't fall in the sphere of the church world are open to that conversation? Yeah, I do actually. Uh, and I think they find it kind of intriguing. Hmm. Um, it's, the, it's the running around their own assumptions that I think is sometimes enlightening. So yeah, I, I do find that. 
in these conversations with these, these uh, cultural figures. Sure, sure. Oh, thank you. All right, sh slight pivot. The various mid-20th century ressourcement movements seem to have served the church well. So where do we go from here? Biblical ressourcement has already borne great fruit. Most patristic texts have been translated and published critically, likewise for the main medieval scholastics. What unexplored sources can we tap today to preach the saving word of God, or to pursue the metaphor? Is it more an issue of pipes, faucets, and bottles that are to, that are to be renewed for us to bring the living water to all those who thirst for God today? Well, uh, <laughs> No, I, I, I'm a great advocate of the resource of all thing. In fact, word on fire, when I get home, <laughs> finally at the end of the synod, when I get home, uh, we're having a conference in Rochester uh, to launch our new journal, which is called the New Resource of all. So I, I'm a great advocate of that movement. And I, I think to, to the, the first practical question, no, I, I don't think a, a lot more you know, critical work needs to be done on the sources. Mm -hmm. You know, what Delubach and company did with Source Chrétien and many others, you know, critical editions and good translations and all that, you know, thank God for it. But I, I think the, uh, the trajectories within the Ressourcement movement are still very important and the themes within it, maybe the most important of which, in my judgment, is a deeply theological reading of scripture. So my generation uh, was raised almost exclusively on historical criticism. Um, you know, the heroes of biblical studies when I was going through university and seminary were Raymond E. Brown and, and Joe Fitzmaier and, and um, Roland Murphy and, you know, the, the Jerome biblical commentary. And so historical criticism was the way to read the Bible. And I love it. I, I mean, I benefit from it. I've read all those people. You read someone like John Meyer at Notre Dame, you know, who was, he just passed away, didn't he, recently? But he would be, I think, the Nick Plus Ultra of that method. Great, great. But see, I, I go back to the, I wonder if you guys read this, uh, uh, Ratzinger's famous Erasmus lecture in 1988 uh, in New York. And all the leading uh, American biblical scholars were there. And Ratzinger said yes to historical criticism. But then he said, it's a limited method. and needs to be supplemented by this much more theological, we probably say today canonical sort of reading of the scriptures. And at the time, I remember, I was, what, 28 when he gave that talk, uh, most of the establishment kind of, you know, tut-tutted it, uh, like, well, you know, poor old Ratzinger. But that paper, I think, for my generation, was, was seminal. Because we realized, you know, yeah, we, we were all raised on historical criticism, and we appreciate it. But there was something limited. It, it was hard to preach out of that tradition. And we lost, as we were so focused on the particularities of, of biblical books and the intentionalities of the human authors, the Bible got balkanized. And we lost the sense of, of thematic unity and, and trajectory and narrative verve. Read someone like N.T. Wright today, who I really admire as a biblical scholar. Wright's got all the historical critical thing in him, but he also has, this is the point I'm making, that more patristic style that is very sensitive to the, the Christological narrative arc of the entire Bible that emphasizes things like typology and the great rhymes within the biblical. And, and honor is what Aquinas would have said, that the principal author of the Bible is God. I mean, if I had said that in Bible class when I was your age, when I was in the seminary, they, they would have laughed at me. What do you mean? I mean, I mean, yeah, in some vague way, I suppose, the author of the Bible is God, but no, I, I think the fathers took that very seriously. Aquinas did too. And I think that's a very important supplement to historical criticism. There is part of the ressourcement that I think we need to keep resourcing. Uh, it'll take new form today. Uh, the question of God has a new texture because of the new atheist critique and all that. So the, the ressourcement people back in the 50s and so on, I mean, weren't wrestling the same way with that question. Uh, disaffiliation, they weren't wrestling. They were just beginning to see maybe the seeds of it back then, but now that's a huge issue. And the apologetic side of the patristics, I think we need to recover. So th that's part of the novelty of the ressourcement movement today. But I think the themes of it, we need to recover. I know there's a great appreciation within that movement for some of the classic literature, but even contemporary, especially with the ressourcement theologians. And you have an appreciation for René Girard and what he did with literary criticism to unpack some important biblical themes 
do you see an increased appreciation of literature helping to strengthen a theological argument to the contemporary listener? Yeah, in my own life, I go back to someone like um, um, Father Dunn at Notre Dame, this is years and years ago, began weaving the literary into his theological writing. And when I started my own writing, that was a high priority for me. And so in like early books of mine, like, and now I see in the strangest way, I consciously brought the literary into it. And I, I've always liked that, you know, the, the Catholic imagination that's kind of a rich tapestry. And to avoid a sort of hyper-rationalism, which that's the shadow side of the scholastic, which I love, I love the scholastics, but the shadow side is a hyper-rationalism. And from the patristic, you'd get more of that poetic alarm. So I think, yeah, that's another facet of the race or Simone. Let's continue with the arts. Are there other art forms that you find lend themselves especially to the proclamation of the gospel to the, the contemporary listener? Well, yeah, it's, I mean, certainly I've, I've relied on, especially a lot of literary artists uh, in my own writing, including, you know, Faulkner and go back to the classic people, Dante, I've used a lot of Flannery O'Connor. So yeah, I mean, I, I find that. In film today, the Coen brothers, I mean, they are dripping with religion. I mean, it's a weird religion and it's, it's an interesting melange of things, but I mean, really spiritually alert filmmakers. Um, Tarantino in his own way, you know? I mean, so I think you can see, look at the, the Coen brothers, Flannery O'Connor is all over the Coen brothers. So I think we religious types should be very sensitive to these uh, artistic forms. Um, you know, today, you know, many comment on, you walk around a city like Rome and you see this explosion of art that followed or is part of the Counter-Reformation. And has there been a similar uh, revival of the arts after Vatican II? I think the answer is no, frankly, to that. Um, I think some of the revivals of classical architecture have been a good thing. Uh, when I was coming of age, uh, Catholic architecture was uh, kind of a warmed over Bauhaus modernism. And in my judgment, it didn't bear the Christian thing very well. Uh, I think in my home parish I grew up in, um, and a lot of other churches I could name that uh, kind of emptied out spaces, um, you know, without a lot of symbolic verve, um, didn't appeal to the senses and the imagination, very rationalistic. To me, to me the, the kind of modernist is a, is a typically sort of Cartesian, hyper-rationalistic form of architecture. So I, I think that was not a happy development. The, the neoclassical revival going on in church architecture, I think, is a positive thing. But you know, I, maybe I'm more sensitive to the literary artists whom I, I love and some of the people I mentioned. And the, maybe it's film, you know, maybe it's film that is exploring some of these things. Sure. With that, do you think, so this question I'm gonna modify a little bit. It's a question about John Paul II's theology of the body and its ability to articulate an adequate theological anthropology. Mm -hmm. Do you think that a more adequate anthropology is approached through literature or through more theological texts? Well, I, I, we, we approach it in a lot of different ways, and that's okay. Uh, John Paul does it very philosophically, it seems to me. The, the biblical element, of course, but you know his deep reliance on the Husserlians and, and on people like Dietrich von Hildebrand and especially and Edith Stein, but especially Max Scheler. So he comes at it in a very philosophical way, and then it's supplemented by his Thomism that he learned here in Rome. Um, the, but the, the novels and the films, yeah, will show the dynamics of it. You know, something, maybe prescinding from the, the questions of sexual ethics in themselves, something I find really interesting in the Theology of the Body of John Paul it is the, the Max Scheler element. So Scheler, it seems to me, like von Hildebrand and all the phenomenologists, saw how the discernment of truth, in some ways, is a bodily thing. You know what I'm saying? It's not just the mind that sees intelligible patterns. It's the body discerns, and with its feelings and its reactions, the body can discern the truth of things. So Shaler makes that argument, that moral truth, you know. And there he reminds me of someone like Martha Nussbaum. Do you guys read her at all, the University of Chicago philosopher? She had a wonderful um, beginning of one of her books where she talks about being here in Europe for a conference. And while she was here, she got word of her mother's death. And she, of course, took it in as an intellectual truth. My mother has died. But on the way home in the plane, she said, 
in her body, she understood what her mother meant and what her death meant. And it was a very, I thought, compelling account of how there's a cognitive element to feeling. Uh, now, this is not to succumb to superficial emotionalism, but it's, it's, it's a quaintness in a way when Thomas says, the soul is in the body, but not as contained by it, but as containing it. There's a line, go on a retreat with that line, and, and you'll be fed for, you know, days. The soul is in the body, not as contained by it, like Descartes, like a little ghost in the machine, but as containing it. The soul is greater than the body, it contains the body. And so as the soul knows, it knows by means of the senses, yes, which are bodily, of course, but by, by emotion and, and by feeling and by the passion. And I, I like that a lot in John Paul's account of the moral life, as he takes in Shaler's thing. And you know who else comes to mind, my fellow Americans, is our American philosopher, William James. Yes. William James is saying these things in the late 19th century. When James said, it's not that I'm sad and therefore I cry, but rather I cry and therefore I know I'm sad. That's really ahead of its time, that kind of statement. But I think it's congruent with Aquinas. Right? The, the soul contains the body. Anyway, that's something, I, when I think about the theology of the body, I think of some of that stuff in John Paul, I think is very rich. And then the Kantianism, I mean, the, the way he revives the categorical imperative. Um, you know, it, it also comes up through the Shaler tradition. Um, read, you know, do you guys read Dietrich von Hildebrand at all? Uh, you know, the great Catholic philosopher. And that's a debate on the right, if you want it, within uh, the Catholic scene today, the Thomists against the Hildebrandians. Um, you want to see a fierce fight sometimes <laughs> you know, on the right, but Hildebrand insisted upon the heart, right? He felt that the Thomists had underplayed the heart, the seat of the emotional life. And he felt that that was of supreme importance, even. Um, I think that's congruent with these things. And of course, he comes out of the Husserl tradition, mm -hmm. not, the, not the Aristotelian tradition. Um, I think that's worth thinking about more and more. But and let me say one more thing about it. I think today, in light of all this gender business, uh, boy, do we need the theology of the body. Because is Gnosticism back? It never really goes away. It's the most persistent heresy. No question about it. No question. The most persistent heresy is Gnosticism. And it's all over the place today. It's in most of our, um, our public education um, uh, systems. There's the real me buried deep down in here somewhere. Talk about the Cartesian thing too, you know, that's the soul is deep down in here or in the pituitary gland or something. But that's a weird modernistic revival of Gnosticism. But it's all over the place now in our culture. The real me is buried here and I can now manipulate the body like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like an astronaut inside the space capsule. But see, that's a weird anthropology, deeply weird and dangerous as all get out. And I went the Pope, the Pope, when I was a bishop in California, we had our ad limina with, with Francis, and uh, we talked for three hours with him about everything. At the end, we all were standing up to leave, and he said, I want you to fight this gender ideology. He said, it's against the Bible, it's repugnant to our teaching, and it's dangerous. And he said, I know it's in, you're in the front lines of it in California. Uh, just as much in Minnesota, trust me, we're in the front lines of it. So I think that's... Boy, do we need the theology of the body, because that's an integrated biblical, um, and I think Aristotelian too, and it, it's, a, it's a healthier strain of, of Western philosophy there. You know? oh, that's helpful. End Thanks. of sermon on that subject. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you see in some of the classical schools with those who are influenced by guys like John Sr., a reappreciation of a pre-rational form of knowledge that's much more yeah. sort of sense-based before a dialectical approach to, to truth. And that seems to be gaining traction in certain circles. And a lot of that tends to look towards something like the liturgy as a way of forming that pre-rational form of knowledge, an incarnational engagement of the senses. Yes, no, I, I think that's a very important theme. You know where you find it too? Find it in uh, Pope Francis, in Laudato Si especially and the technocratic paradigm. That's, the, I think, what he's getting at. And of course, who is his teacher there but Guardini? You know, do you guys read the letters from Lake Como by Guardini? It's a great text, very important text. Guardini who forms Rahner, forms Ratzinger, forms Balthazar, all those people, and, and Bergoglio. And uh, this idea that um, 
I stand here as kind of the Lord of creation and my sovereign will is going to dictate terms to creation. He's right. He, Bergoglio, and he, Guardini, they're right in saying that's a weird modernism. That's coming up out of Descartes and company. Uh, but the pre-modern, the pre-modern has this much richer, I think much more beautiful approach. It, it, when Aristotle says philosophy begins in wonder, that's a world of difference from philosophy exists to master nature, which is Descartes and, and Bacon and those people. In Aristotle, it begins in wonder. That's a whole different attitude. Um, and that I'm, read Aquinas on this, I mean, that I'm part of this natural reality. Uh, and it's deeply biblical, too. You know, salvation is not just a matter of I'm saving my soul. Salvation has to do with all of God's creation being redeemed and so on. Uh, so I love that. I love those pre-modern themes. Because I, I think willy-nilly, we're so shaped by modernity. We're, we're so shaped, it's just like, it's the air we breathe. Mm -hmm. But the church represents, in a very healthy way, I don't mean some, you know, uh, old, look at old-fashioned conservatism. I, I mean, in a very healthy way, recovering that pre-modern imagination. Yeah, yeah. No, that's very good. Thank you. So continuing the theme of the liturgy and its relationship to evangelization, St. Augustine said that one first believes and then understands, since the lex orandi precedes the lex credendi, in Sacrosanctum, Sacrosanctum Concilium calls the Eucharist the outstanding means of manifesting to others the mystery of Christ. How do you see the sacred liturgy playing a role in introducing a non-believer to the Paschal mystery? Well, first of all, a non-believer is unlikely to come to Mass. <laughs> so in that way, I, I wouldn't put so much evangelical weight on it in that sense. I think probably what happens more naturally is people that come to Mass are Christified thereby. And Christified people go out into the world in a transforming way. They go out bringing Christ to the world and into the workplace and so on. And people see Christified people and they're intrigued and they're drawn. I think that's probably more naturally how it works. Having said that, um, you know what comes to my mind? Uh, the Seven Story Mountain of Merton was a very important book when I was a young guy. And, um, you know, Merton basically has moved into kind of a, a pagan mentality by the time he's in his late teens. Uh, he discovers Etienne Gilson's Spirit of Medieval Philosophy, and it's an introduction to the metaphysics of the Middle Ages that convinces him that God is a serious idea, right? So that's happened to him. But then he said one morning he wakes up, Sunday morning, and he feels this, this urge, go to Mass, go to Mass. And Merton barely knew what the Mass was at that point. He barely knew what it was. But he knew where this Catholic church was, Corpus Christi, near Columbia. And he walked in, and he genuflected on the wrong knee, and he didn't know what he was doing, and he felt embarrassed, didn't know when to stand or sit, but got through the Mass, right? And then he goes to a, a coffee shop afterwards. And this beautiful little lyrical passage, he says, though I was sitting in a grimy coffee shop on 115th Street, it was as though I was in the Elysian fields. And so, I mean, something happened to him, obviously, during Mass. He barely knew what it was, but something happened to him during Mass. So that can happen, for sure. It has an evangelical power. Or the story I love, I heard this many years ago from a priest in uh, San Francisco. And he was dealing with a lady who was a pagan, basically. I mean, nothing about religion, nothing about the church. Like, nothing, nothing. But she was kind of wondering and seeking. So he said to her, you know that church, and he named it, whatever it was. I want you to go in there, and you'll see there's like a little red lamp, a little red light up near the front. I want you to go up there, and I want you to sit as close as you can to that light. She goes, well, what does that light mean? I'll, I'll tell you later. Just, just go in there and sit by the light. And, okay, she did. And then he said, I did go every day. Just go every day. Spend like 15 minutes. Sit by that light. And at the end of that experience, <laughs> she said, I, I don't know. I I just feel like I should be in church all the time, and I just feel I, I want to become a Catholic. And what is it about that light? And then he, of course, told her, well, that's, that's the you know, tabernacle lamp, and that's the blessed sacrament. Well, all right, I think the, the liturgy, the Eucharist, has, a, has an evangelical power that we can't fully understand. So, yeah, bring people to Mass if you can and see what happens. But I think typically it's Christified people go out in an evangelical manner. Sure, you know? sure. And uh, a 
parish that I was serving as pastor, we had perpetual adoration, and yeah. we had so many people just come off the street, yeah. not know what to do. I didn't know what to do, so we would just bring them to the adoration chapel, right. and that did incredible things. And especially in this time of the Eucharistic revival, that would seem to be a good time to unpack these conversations. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, continuing the, with the liturgy, but shifting to a more personal gear, how do you prepare for a normal Sunday homily? Do you have any particular commentaries or books that you use for preparation? Uh, for, the, for the books, it's the fathers, um, especially Origen. Origen's my man when it comes to the Bible. Um, people say to me all the time, hey, Bishop, boy, that homily, what, a, what an interesting idea. Boy, that's so novel, and where'd you, we have such a fresh perspective. And I say, it's from the third century. <laughs> uh, but it's true, I, I'm just, you know, because look at even the great Augustine largely cribs from Origen. Augustine's marvelous biblical commentaries, he got it from Origen. Um, Origen's the master, I think. He's the master of biblical reading. Um, and a lot of my stuff from, I've done uh, like formal biblical commentaries and then preaching, a lot of it is origin. It's the fathers, that's where I learned how to preach. Yes. When I was going through school, <laughs> it was a different world and we were not taught to preach that way. We were taught to begin with a joke or a story, um, you know, related to people's experience all the way. And you know what the turning point was for me? This is true. Um, I'm a teacher at Mundelein, and I offered a course called The Christology of the Poets and Preachers. And my purpose there was not to do formal high academic Christology. It was to do Christology as revealed in these more lyrical figures, right? So I had the students read, so I, of course, had to read it first. The great sermons from, from Origen <clears throat> through Augustine up to Bernard, into the, into the modern period, we had Newman, we read Chesterton, we went up to Paul Tillich, we went the whole range of the tradition. You know what struck me? <laughs> None of them preached in the way I was taught to preach. Not one. Not from the ancient world to the medieval world to the modern world. The sermons that the tradition preserved were not in the manner that I was taught. That was a real eye-opener. Because what I saw was, read Newman, for, read Newman's sermons? Uh, begin with a joke and re relate to people's experience. I mean, Newman is like massively biblical, massively biblical. So is Origen, so is Bernard, so is Aquinas, you know. Uh, I I'm with Karl Barth. You know, the idea is not um, correlation. That's Paul Tillich. Barth says it's to draw people into the marvelous jungle of the Bible. <laughs> you know, the Bible is this rich thicket of personalities and and narratives and symbols, and, and it's a weird country. It's like moving into Tolkien's um, Lord of the Rings. You know, you need to be introduced to this wild new world. That's preaching. And now draw your world into the biblical world, not vice versa. Don't reduce the biblical world to your little puny world. You know, my experience, ho-hum. Rather, draw your experience into the Bible, <laughs> you know? Uh, there, there's an asymmetry between the biblical world and our world. They interact. So the same Bart is the one who famously said, I preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Quite right. But it wasn't using the newspaper to read the Bible. It was the Bible to read the newspaper. And, and that's a difference. That's a huge difference in the way you approach preaching, I think. Yeah. And given that a large number of folks in the pews may at best have an eighth grade level of Catholic education and oftentimes have resulted as a, some form of secular humanist, whether or not, yeah. you know, not questioning their own personal faith, but or, practically. Or kind of moralizing catechesis is therefore what happens in a lot of our preaching is I'm going to teach you something about the moral life. Let's get, draw a little lesson from the scripture. Rather than, especially for people who don't know the Bible or, or totally secularized. Good, good, let's go on an adventure. I'm gonna take you into this really weird world of the Bible. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow your mind with this world. I'm gonna draw you into its, its strangeness and its power. Um, I'm gonna teach you its, its trajectories and its narrative uh, purpose. Um, you know, that's why do people read Tolkien? They don't read Tolkien because it's, it, it reminds me of my own experience. It's, it like takes you into another world that transforms your experience and makes it different. Uh, that's good preaching, it seems to me. Um, it's explosive good preaching. <laughs> I 
I've quoted that. In fact, I remember doing it here years ago at the NAC. I had the Sunday Mass, and I quoted that line from, I don't know where I first read it, but it was an Anglican bishop that said, when Paul preached, there were riots. When I preach, they serve me tea. You know, <laughs> but that's the problem. Because, see, they serve me tea because, oh, you, you very nicely drawn the Bible into my world. You know, you tamed it. You domesticated it. Uh, it's explosive when you do the other thing. That's good preaching, I think. Yeah, yeah. There's a, I've heard a, a common fallacy is Christ came not to bring peace but the sword. My preaching brings division, therefore I must be serving Christ. How do you find an effective approach to proclaiming the sovereignty of Christ as the name under heaven, the only name by which men can be saved, that is able to be heard, that is effective, that doesn't come across as high-handed or something otherwise repulsive to, to the average well, secularist? Yeah, I mean, so there you're getting at the Lumen Gentium 16 kind of question, right? That, I mean, if we're saved, we're saved by Christ. There's no question about that. Christ is the unique Savior. But his grace is available to varying degrees in other uh, forms. So Vatican II teaches, right? In the other great religions and philosophy, even in the, in the sovereignty of your conscience. So even the atheist of goodwill can be saved. Mind you, please, I'm not saying will be saved, don't worry about it. I'm saying can be saved, right? So that, that's Lumen Gentium 16. And uh, I think that's the right place to be. Because if you hyper-stress, you know, it's only in Christ, well, then you're condemning the majority of the human race to damnation. Uh, I don't think that's a really good evangelical strategy. If you go the other direction, you have just a, a pure relativism or indifferentism. So Lumen Gentium 16 carves out the space where I think people should be, uh, or I, I try to be. You, you declare Christ, but not in this aggressive, hell-threatening way. But, it, you know, I found something that's so... Uh, life enhancing and so compellingly beautiful in, in, in Christ, I want you to know about it. I want you to share in that thing. You know, Balsar says that, that every person that's been addressed by the beautiful becomes a missionary of the beautiful. That's true, isn't it? I mean, when you, you see a great movie, your, your first instinct is, hey, 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 you've got to see this movie. You become an evangelist of that movie. Um, you, you hear a singer that you love and you want to tell the world about that singer. So a fortiori with the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course you want to tell the whole world. But I mean, I don't think threatening hell is a good evangelical strategy. So uh, Lumen Gentium 16, I think, is the right place to stay. My position, I've often said, is in the catechism. In hope, the church prays for the salvation of all. Good. That's the right position, it seems to me. Uh, so can I pray for the salvation of all people, Christian, non-Christian? Sure, in hope that Christ's grace somehow reaches them, you know. In the meantime, do all you possibly can to bring the grace of Christ to as many as you can. That's remarkable, the two great Christian hymns of the Maranatha, Come Lord Jesus, and yet the Dies Irae at the same time. The tension of, we want the Lord to come, but how awful the day of his arrival. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. No. That's true. I mean, the cross is, the cross is judgment, right? Because the cross reveals um, sin. The, the cross is like a light that reveals the dark corners of my sin. And so every confrontation with Christ is a confrontation with the judge, no question about it. Um, but it's, it's a judgment for the sake of life. Right? It's, an, it's an illumination of my sin that I, that I might get rid of my sin. So it's, it, I remember my, my doctoral director in Paris, the great Michel Corbin, he's a wonderful Anselm scholar and Thomas scholar. He said, what the fathers taught him was, if you read any biblical passage and your conclusion is that you're depressed or you're angry or you're sad, you've misread it, period. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm giving a namby-pamby Bible. It just means at the end of the day, it's all about the divine love. Now, the divine love can have an awful quality to it, mm -hmm. you know. But if you've, if you've ended your reading with, God, I'm sad and depressed and angry, uh, you've misread the Bible. Period. Can you think of an example of sober Christian joy or a good example of what authentic Christian joy looks like in a particular saint that comes that may, maybe you have an affinity for? Well, I mean, the little flower is one of my great spiritual heroes. I think she exemplifies that. Aquinas, to me, is, is, um, is a joyful figure. Um, you know, when he was asked, what does God do all day? He said he enjoys himself. Hmm. This is a lovely answer and, and dead right, it seems to me. What does God do all day? He enjoys himself. <laughs> He's in the presence of the absolute good, and so his will can rest perfectly in it. Um, 
It, it's who, what's the, who said the famous line? It's the definitive mark of the Holy Spirit is joy. I think that's right. Um, you know, I think I've known some saintly people in my life, I think, who really are saints, and that's the mark, is you come away joyful from them. Um, someone said that there are two types of people in the world, those who suck air out of a room and those who breathe life into a room. And I think that's largely right, you know. There's some people you come away from and like life has been sucked out of you, you know. And other people, you're with them and you're, you're more alive and you're more joyful. Uh, that's a good way to think about your own spiritual life. At the end of the day, did I suck air out of the room today or did I breathe life into the room? That sounds like a great criteria for seminary and evaluations. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes, I would say that's right. When looking at it, okay, what is it, does this guy suck air out of the room? <laughs> or does he breathe life into it? That's, yeah, that is good. That is good. If you get the nickname Hoover, you know it's not a good thing. <laughs> not a good thing. Well, a number of our men in the house are preparing to promise to pray the Liturgy of the Hours as ordained deacons next year. They're preparing their reflections on this promise, and so I think they're looking for some backup. What has been your relationship with the Liturgy of the Hours through your years as mm. a cleric and the relationship between the Liturgy of the Hours for a cleric as a duty, a right, a blessing? Yeah, it's good. That's a good uh, searching question. You know, I'll tell you exactly when my relationship with the Hours began. I was a, a Basilin scholar at Catholic U. Any Basilins here, by the way? Aren't there some Basilins? Yeah, I can't see the hands, but... Um, I was about 19, I guess, and uh, uh, Monsignor Robert Sokolowski was my, my sort of academic hero when I was there. And he said to us calmly one day, you know, some people claim that, that God is their, is their best friend, God's the most important person in their life, but they just, they hardly ever pray. And he said, that's simply incoherent. And I remember I thought, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, so I was a seminarian. I wasn't obliged to pray the office yet. And in those days, trust me, we didn't pray the office in the seminary. Um, <laughs> But I remember thinking, yeah, that's right. And so I went out, I, I don't know what little money I, I had, I bought that little one volume of the Liturgy of the Hours and began praying it. And it was always Sokolowski's um, voice in my head. Okay, if you claim God is the most important person in your life, you have to talk to God regularly. So it started there. Um, you know, I've been a priest for, what, 37 years. I've been praying the office all that time. Um, Good times and bad times with it, yes. Uh, times when it's, it seems more like tiresome, sure. Um, I'll say this though, I, as I've gotten older, I've gotten better at prayer, I think. I don't mean that in a, in a like, toot my own horn sort of way. I just mean, I think it does get easier. And you become habituated to it. And, and you, you get it, and it's a source of, of joy, not just obligation. So I begin the day uh, with a holy hour. I'm more of a morning person. So I spend an hour in the chapel of my house and I pray a, a chunk of the office during that time, rosary to other things. Um, and I, I love that time. I mean, I, I miss it. Like one thing about this uh, synod is <laughs> it's messed up my prayer life completely because you know what it has. And, it's thrown my, the rhythm off and I don't have the same kind of time and it's so time consuming and, um, and I, I hate that. You know, I, I love that time of prayer and the Liturgy of the Hours is a big part of it. And the Psalms, I mean, you guys know that. When you start praying the Psalms, how, how marvelous and gorgeous they are and you know, it's a cliche to say, but it's true. They speak to the whole range of human experience. You know, it's marvelous, marvelous. Something else about, about the Psalms, uh, this came from another very wise teacher of mine. You know the Psalm we pray, uh, Friday night, night prayer, that kind of desperate Psalm, I forget the number, but you know, where I'm lying in the grave and the darkness is my only friend and I'm, you know. And I, I remember this, this wise teacher said, you know, I know when you're praying that, you probably don't feel that way. But trust me, someone in the body of Christ, somewhere in the world, feels exactly that way right now and you're praying for him, you're praying for her. And that, that was one of those simple remarks, but it just opened up a, a window. And I thought, right, uh, there's the duty side of it, right? I don't feel like praying tonight. Well, get over it, <laughs> because you're not praying for you. 
just for your own, you know, private religious uh, um, uh, thrill, you're, you're obligated as a priest to pray for the church. And it might not be benefiting you even that much, but it, you're praying for someone that can't pray tonight, yes. that should be praying but isn't, you know. You're identifying, think of uh, Charles Williams here, the idea of, of uh, co-inherence, right, that we, we inhere in each other. That's why we can say things like, I'll pray for you, or I'll offer that up for you, or I'll offer my suffering for you. And you say, well, what a nice, pious idea. <clears throat> that is not just a pious idea. That's a very profound metaphysical claim, right, that we're implicated in each other. And so when you pray those psalms, it might not be the psalm for you personally, but you're praying for someone else in the mystical body. That's the obligation side of it, which I take very seriously. And Priests um, that stop praying in the office, bad sign. It's a really bad sign. And it usually, in my experience, is a sign of deeper trouble. So I would say to you guys, maybe just starting your, your careers as prayers of the, of the hours, uh, make it central. Dedicate yourself to it. Uh, and, and when you say, I'm not in the mood for this, hear my voice saying, I don't care. You know, because you're praying for other people in the mystical body. And uh, in the long run, that will benefit you, too. Um, so, no, I, I take it with great seriousness. John Paul, too, did, too. Some of the texts of John Paul on the, on the hours of how indispensably central it is to the spiritual life. And I think that's right. Yeah. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, this may be more of a, a personal question, but is there a particular spiritual writer that you have found especially helpful in your life as a priest? Spiritual writer or theological writer? Spiritual or? writer. Well, um, I'm a John of the Cross man. My, my home parish uh, was St. John of the Cross when I was a little kid, so I, I knew the name. I discovered him probably through Merton. Uh, Merton opened a lot of doors and windows for me when I was a, a young guy reading the Seven Story Mountain, The Sign of Jonas, The New Man, uh, New Seeds of Contemplation, all those classic texts. And Merton opened, you know, the, the windows to all these people. So I probably discovered John of the Cross as a spiritual person through Merton. But I, he's, he's a touchstone figure for me. Um, so is Ignatius of Loyola. Um, the, the whole spirituality of, of detachment, which is a kind of spirituality of interior freedom, uh, is very important, I think, in the, in the spiritual order. All the stuff I've done on, you know, the, the wheel of fortune and the wealth, pleasure, honor, and power and being detached and living in the center, all of that I learned from these masters. Uh, the little flower, you know, um, in all her wonderful simplicity, but the, um, the little way is, is extremely illuminating and liberating, I think, once you interiorize it, is no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what, what kind of day you're having, you're succeeding, you're failing, no matter what, you can always find the path of love, right? To will the good of the other. You're lying sick on, in, in bed. You can pray for somebody. You're, you're angry. With, okay, I can, I can pray for that person. You can perform the simplest act of love, no matter what. And that's the heart of the Christian spiritual life. So the little flower had a big uh, impact on me. As I said, Merton, when I was a young guy, um, was, a, was a very important player for me in kind of teaching me contemplative prayer. Um, one of Merton's lines there, which I love because it, it resonates with my Thomistic side, he said, contemplative prayer is finding the place in you where you are here and now being created by God. Uh, that's, again, a line. Go on retreat with that line. To pray, really to pray, is to find the place right now where you are being created by God. It's like the water bubbling up in you to eternal life, right? Um, so Merton was a key player for me, too. Baltazar, you know, a theological writer, but also a spiritually important figure for me. So drawing from act to willing the good of the other, the way of love, the idea of the liturgy of the hours and as a prayer of sort of solidarity with the entire church, what do you think are actual, helpful, or authentically Christian ways of showing solidarity with Christians facing real and severe persecution around the world. For example, Nicaragua, China, Nigeria. You know, how do we do more than just sort of raise awareness, but actually exercise that, that real Christian solidarity with them? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a hard question because you're, you're moving into the realm of prudential judgment there. Um, certainly, to pray in solidarity, and that's not a trivial thing at all, um, John Allen and others have, have shown us, I mean, this is a massively bad time for a Christian persecution. We are the most persecuted religion by far anywhere in the world. And I think awareness of that, raising consciousness about it, praying about it, yes, indeed, all that. When it comes to particulars, uh, it's trickier. Um, think of, you know, John Paul in Poland and fighting communism. Yeah, I mean, I think he had all the right instincts, but he also had a country that was 98% Catholic. And he knew in his great prudential wisdom that he could draw on that and find strength of resistance in it. But does that apply in every case? Clearly no, because every case is very different. Uh, China, for example, no, I mean, Christians, Catholics being persecuted in China, yes, indeed. But is the John Paul II strategy the right one in a country that is overwhelmingly non-Christian? So, I mean, I, I, I'll leave plenty of room for prudential judgment and people that know what's on the ground. You know, and it, Pius XII and, and Hitler, you know, uh, the same dilemma. So why didn't he just speak out against Hitler? And Well, because Edith Stein was put to death. Because, you know, I mean, it, it's a little glib for us to say, well, they all should have done X, Y, and Z. So I don't know. I think you've got to be on the ground to know how best to engage that. But consciousness, prayer, solidarity, I mean, all that, yes. And uh, not to be blind to these, these really outrageous uh, persecutions of, of Christians. Yeah. Well, with that going on the flip side, where, where sin abounds, grace abounds, all the more we see that there are sort of flowers, if you will, of the, of the evangelization coming up in different ways throughout the world. It seems to be globally south, some yeah. you know, east, but... Uh, where have you seen the Lord present or active? This is a, a big question, so pick, pick your lane as you like or cover all of them. In the Vatican, Rome, or yourself uh, in, in recent <laughs> Those history? Are, Vatican, Rome. <laughs> or other. Rome. There's always other. Do you mean like, like now at the Synod or in general? <laughs> What's, where's an area where you see the, Lord act, you know, the Lord's grace sort of bearing greater fruit? Maybe on a global scale or a more local scale? Well, no, I, I think you can see in the West now that there's a reaction to the, the new atheism and this hyper-materialism. I think you can see that. Um, you know, whether it's in a, something like a Jordan Peterson and his popularity and others like him, but I, I think a generation that took in this god-awful message, you know, that there, you come from nothing, you're going to nothing, there's no objective moral value, the universe is coldly indifferent to everything that you're involved in, and you know, people took that in from Dawkins and Harris and company, and oh yeah, let's give it to religion. But then they realized, wait a minute, that's the message? That's what I'm left with? And I think the reaction to that has been a reawakening mm. to the spiritual and the religious. Um, some of these people I've talked to, I, I don't know if you know this guy, this Lex Friedman, do you, do you see, follow him at all? A very interesting podcaster, he's an MIT professor of like artificial intelligence, and he's a Russian American, uh, interesting guy and has spoken to like everyone under the sun and he had me on and in, in a very kind of simple you know curious way begins asking about religion and about God and um, you know gets a huge reaction from people Peterson is I think is a very interesting test case because as he's talking about the Bible and opening up in these really fresh ways millions of young men especially are responding to him that says something to me about an evangelical openness. Um, it also begs the question, where were we? <laughs> you know, when the, the uh, new atheists were doing their thing 20 some years ago, we were pathetic to tell you the God's truth. By we, I mean uh, Catholics and Christians engaging those folks. It took a William Lane Craig, God bless him. He's one of the few people I think that could do it well. By the way, calling on our intellectual tradition, <laughs> you know, but where were we? Uh, I, we had thrown a lot of our weapons away. You know, apologetics, who needs it? It's old fashioned, it's rationalistic, who needs it? And then when the enemies rose up with a lot of energy and there we were with nothing, you know. Uh, why aren't we in the place that Peterson's in? Why is he the one opening up the Bible in this fresh way? And I, God bless him, I, I support that. But uh, where were we? I think is a good question. Um, 
I'm, what, what I've tried to do in these years of Word on Fire is, is to do just that, is to be at least a voice or a presence in the wider cultural conversation. Uh, I think people respond. I think they're very interested in religion. And when you do it in a way that's um, got some intellectual heft, which our tradition does, thank God. And um, so I think that, that's my clarion call to all of you, is, is get in that conversation. Um, and one of the worst things we do, by the way, is bickering among ourselves, these silly fights within the Catholic world. And you go on Catholic social media, what do you find? The Catholics fighting with each other. Plague on both your houses. I mean, it's, that's so anti-evangelical. And uh, I'd say get out there into the wider conversation. Get out there in, in where the young people are, are looking for meaning and for purpose. And, Inhabit that space that Peterson and others have, have moved into. Why aren't we there? You know? Yeah. See, the difference is the, <clears throat> the attitude of there's so much to do, where do we start, versus there's so much to do, where can we start? Yeah, I know, again, I, not to over rely on my, my own experience, but uh, I just think about this because um, the, the man, he was a good friend of mine who just died today, Rich Danstrom. Uh, we were, in the, when I was starting out in Chicago is in this parish, and Rich was there, and we had become friends. And uh, I just started doing sermons on the radio, the local radio station in Chicago. And Rich came to me and said, you know, um, you should get these put up on a website. And honest to God, I said, what's a website? I, I didn't know what a website was. This was like 1998 or something. And he said, oh, no, I'll get it set up for you. And so he did. He set up the first. And then he said, what should we call it? And I said, oh, I don't want to call it the, the Father Baron. I, I don't want to do that. And we came up with word on fire as the word for it. But that's how it started, you know. And I remember Rich coming to me a couple weeks later saying, uh, it's not doing well. No one's watching it. <laughs> and I remember saying, uh, oh, really? Yeah, well, um, the, what's that thing? Web? Yeah, God, well, God bless you. Thanks for trying, you know. That's what I thought about it. My point in the story is uh, start. Start, you know. That's, that's how it started. And I just kept doing these sermons and then YouTube, and then an audience begins to build, and um, try it. Jump in the pool. Well, you certainly do it well, and we're very grateful for you being a man in the arena. So, our uh, last question, you're going to be going home in a short period of time. What five, are you, what, five days, I think? <laughs> but who's counting? Who's counting? What are you looking forward to going home to the most? Getting back to my life. <laughs> because... Uh, there is something very unreal about the last month, you know, and uh, it's getting back to my regular routine in the diocese. I mean, I, I can't wait to get back to parishes, and I, I can't wait to get back to the office, <laughs> you know, and just do some the basic work as a, as a bishop. I'm, I'm looking forward to that immensely, actually, because it's not just the synod. You know, I was in, in Lisbon, World Youth Day, and I had all, I was in Washington for USCCB. I was at Harvard to give talks. Then I had talks to all the priests of my diocese, and I came right from that to the airport to fly here. So I've been kind of on a, on a train, which I'm eager to get off of. Sure. I'm just eager to get back to my regular life Yeah, no. <laughs> when I get home. Absolutely understandable. Well, I want to leave you the last word. Anything else you would like to leave us with before we conclude tonight? Well, I mean, I, I, I believe in you and what you're doing, and it's massively important. Um, you know, as I look out at the world, and uh, not to sound too grandiose, but you look out at the culture, especially at young people, there are armies of people who are lost, spiritually lost. And it's because this crazy culture of ours with, you know, the, the Dawkins thing would be the extreme of it, you know, the complete nihilism. But also this uh, culture of self-invention is, is deadly. I make up my own life. I make up my values. I decide everything. I'm in, I'm, I determine even my gender and my body. And, that's a deadly uh, farrago of ideas, and people are suffering from it. I see it all the time. And so those who are committed to Christ and to the church and to the gospel, don't think for a minute that you're in some little you know, ghetto. No, no, you're, you've, got, you've got the bread of life. You've got the elixir. You, you've got, you've got the, the water bubbling up to eternal life, and people need it. So the studies you're doing here in theology, spirituality, Bible, uh, that's, that's your, that's life, you know. 
and the world needs it. So don't give up and don't think there's something a little, you know, sectarian or peculiar about what you're doing. It is of huge central importance to the transformation of the world. And uh, do it. Stay on the beam. Stay on the task. Do it. Bishop Robert Barron, thank you. You're welcome.